man of God uh, by name Harry Einside as he was preaching in the morning in the evening as he began his uh, message he said sixthly that is uh, he didn't want to repeat all the first five but for us I think uh, I might repeat it just so that we might continue the thought process so first Corinthians chapter 15 verse 35 and verse 58 there are other portions of scripture I would have us turn but uh, for now we'll t read these two verses first Corinthians chapter 15 verses 35 and verses 58 let us read together all together but some man will say how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come verse 58 Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I'll have us turn to Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 if you are there we'll read all all together this verse I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me we'll read one more portion from the book of Job the book of Job, chapter 14. Book of Job, chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. We will read responsively. Book of Job, chapter 14, verses 1 to 5. Shall we rise to read this portion? I know at this time of the evening we would have been in a different world. <laughs> and... Uh, I know pretty well how things are, uh, so let's uh, take some time to stand and sit so that it will give us some uh, good uh, sense to focus as well. Let's read verses 1 to 5 responsively. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and count continueth not. And dost thou open thine eyes upon such an one, and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Verse 5. Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. One more portion and then we'll sit. It is in Job chapter 19 verses 25 to 27. We'll read this portion all together. Job chapter 19 verses 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer liveth and that the, he shall stand at the later day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Let us sit down, please, and let's pray and look to the Lord for his word, shall we? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this privilege that you've given that we may come together in this fashion to receive thy word, the treasures of wisdom that you have preserved for us in thy living and forever abiding word. Thy word which is settled in heaven that not only makes us wise unto salvation but also makes us wise to live a life, Lord, that is well-pleasing to Thee, all because of Your Son and His work on the cross and also in us. Lord, we thank You, we praise You for each one of us that are here. Lord, uh, 
our bodies are weak, but your spirit may minister to us that our, our hearts may be revived and renewed. And Lord, the, through the living and abiding word of yours, that we may receive life to live out in this world. Father, I pray that you would bless our receiving of your word, that it would be fruitful unto eternity. Speak to us now, as I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So turning back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the morning we've uh, been looking at this beautiful chapter as I was introducing. I was giving to us that Paul was laboring to establish how Christian faith is a faith that permeates not just into what we receive as new life in Christ Jesus through faith, but also into the new world or new heavens that we would be inheriting onto eternity. And uh, the focus of this chapter is centered around how Paul was correcting or reinstating the truths about the resurrection of the dead. And so we saw the order of rising in the morning. And in that continuation this evening, I want to bring to us the message on the order of residing, where uh, I've uh, just made it to be in line with the previous uh, uh, sermon's title, but uh, it is primarily to understand how you and I are to live in this world. Now that we understand that there is an order of rising that a child of God comes to receive and uh, have this faith beyond uh, or hope beyond this grave that there will be a day where they will rise and that those that are in Christ would come to rise just as Christ rose from the dead to be with him forever and ever. And so we've seen uh, in the morning about how or rather why there is this resurrection of the dead. From verses 12 onwards, Paul, after he talks about the hypothetical scenario, he brings to us from verses 20 to 23 why we can come to understand that there is this resurrection of the dead. Just as how real the original sin is, so is it that uh, in Adam, how we have received it, so is it that we are going to receive the resurrection of the dead in new Adam or the last Adam, that is our Lord Jesus Christ. We also understood that just as Christ is the first fruit, you and I are already the first fruits by being regenerated by the word of God so that you and I can bear much fruit. We saw that. And then the third one is you and I are being brought into much assurance because just as Christ rose and had set this order of resurrection onto life, you and I are going to partake in that order of much assurance. I said in the morning that we will continue on that part of much assurance and uh, continue on three other aspects that we would receive that uh, uh, that we will continue. So le let me bring to us, apart from laboring on why there is resurrection of the dead in this letter, chapter 15, Paul goes about to give how there will be that resurrection of the dead. In verse 35, the verse that we read, from then on, Paul brings to us how there will be this resurrection of the dead. You and I might understand the why, but there were those in the Corinthian church who want to understand the how, and we too, and which would give to us such assurance that uh, would be resulting in a life of ministry. So far, we've seen certain aspects, a life of understanding, a life that understands the depth of our original sin. We've, we've received that life. We've also received life for fruit bearing, for bearing much fruit, you have received by abiding in the word, we get that life of fruit bearing. Thirdly, we receive this life of assuring, where when we understand that there is this order of resurrection for the dead, apart from the why, the how, 
We come to see in verses 35, op, after verse 35, as Paul raises that question, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? And you know, Paul had these strong words. These days we might not use such words. In verse 36, he begins and says, Thou, thou foolish. Such strong words that Paul has. And then this word fool actually has two aspects of it. One, foolish because of ignorance, because they don't know. There are those who are foolish because they are bent on believing a lie rather than the truth. And so there were those who were saying that there is no resurrection of the dead because they want to believe that and they were bringing this confusion. And God, through the word, was bringing this order as Paul opens to the light of the word of God to give to us how that resurrection of the dead would happen. And then in verse 37, Paul turns to the rest of the creation to see if there are marks of resurrection around. And that's what he shows, he shows in verse 37. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be, but a bare grain. It may chance of a wheat or of some other grain. So when you and I see how harvest happened, how this grain turns into becoming a plant or a, or a tree and bring forth fruit, you and I understand that there is a concept of resurrection. There is a concept of new life that comes from death. And that's the same thing that you find in the nature. When you and I think about this, I wonder if uh, Martin Luther got his quote that he said on resurrection. He says, Our Lord has written the promise of resurrection not in books alone, but in every life in springtime. Meaning, when you look at life, we are in spring. How there is this new life, the tree goes dead, leafless, lifeless in the time of winter. But as spring comes up, you see this promise of resurrection as though there is this new life, new leaves, new fruit coming alive. And just as you see that, that is a, 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 a reality of how nature echoes this this power of resurrection, this work of resurrection that the Lord had promised to us. And so Paul is alluding to the same as he talks about how a seed dies before it can bring forth wheat and, and grain as such. And so we never sow the grain to, or uh, a wheat plant to get that wheat plant. We sow a seed. And so Paul is explaining to us just like that, there is this natural process of sowing to bear the eternal life. And so in verses 42 onwards, he goes about it. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body and is raised in as a spiritual body. So... Paul goes about to labor to explain the how of resurrection. And all that he does so to bring to us that much assurance. You know why? Resurrection is going to bring to us two great goals that are beyond us as well. The reason why there should be resurrection is not because we need an eternal life, but because of what Christ had come to do in this world. Christ as a sinless offering had come to overcome the enemies of our soul. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20, um, let, let's, re, let's turn back to verse 26. He talks about this last enemy. Jesus, he comes to destroy the enemies. We were reminded in the worship time in the morning that there are so many enemies that rise against those that have been made in his own image. That is, you and I as God's children. As every weapon that rises against us, there will not be any condemnation because of Christ who conquered all those enemies. And the last enemy that would be conquered is death. And, uh, and that is really going to be brought to pass when you and I are going to be raised up from the grave. Where death is going to be overturned forever. Not for 
a moment or a time but forever to destroy the last enemy that is death and he explains that destruction of the last enemy in the last portion of this same chapter in verses 55 onwards first corinthians chapter 15 verses 55 onwards paul goes about to say verses 54 the last part death is swallowed up in victory and he goes on to say o oh death where is thy sting o oh grave where is thy victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law verse 57 it says but thanks be to god who giveth us that victory through our lord jesus christ through our lord jesus christ and so paul concludes that process of explaining to us the what of the resurrection of the dead and the why of the resurrection of the dead he also in the middle shows a great mystery i just would touch on that before i move on in verse 51 he says behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall be changed oh this great grand mystery of how god's going to overturn death as we will be changed in that glorious rapture of when christ comes to receive us in verse 52 he says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump of the for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised into raised incorruptible and we shall be changed now paul concludes this primarily to show to us that much assurance that we get from the scripture is going to lead us into a life of ministry which is why in verse 58 i read this in the morning and i'm going to continue from there the fourth aspect of coming to receive the right order of rising will be that we will receive the order of residing that is living in this world how are you and i to live in this world in the light of all that we receive in christ jesus the hope beyond the grave and all that we receive we receive all that to live a life of ministry now verse 58 he concludes and gives this as an application from all that he says that you and i receive in christ jesus in the order of resurrection from the dead is that you and i receive a life of ministry here in verse 58 he says therefore my beloved brethren be ye steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the lord the lord knows that the lord is giving to us an assurance that because you and i have our eternity that is settled in this life you and i the rest of our life can be li- lived out as a life of ministry unto this risen savior who is alive worthy to be served that you and i can serve him fully steadfast unmovable always abounding that's the privilege of every child of god who receives this this life of ministry now apart from the life of ministry so we are we are com- we are coming to understand the order of residing how are you and i to live in the light of the order of rising we understood that there is an order of rising which results in how you and i are to live in this world the first life we are called to live is a life of ministry now apart from a life of ministry in uh, this evening's message i have two people that we are looking at to give to us the applications of how you and i are to live in this world one is the life of apostle paul who is giving to us this call to live a life of ministry and uh, a personal uh, life of his that gives to us that calls us to live as how he lived turn with me to galatians chapter 2 verse 20 this is how paul himself lived in this world when he was living upon this earth he called us encouraging us saying we are called to live a life of ministry out of much assurance we receive that much assurance that we receive should result in much serving 
you know, in this life, you and I will be serving something or someone if you and I don't turn to serving the true and the living God. There is a, an enemy of our soul longing that we would serve him. He called our Lord Jesus himself to bow to him and to serve him so that he would give the glories of this world. Jesus withheld and he said, serve and worship God alone. And today, as you and I receive that much assurance, we come to see that Christian life is lived backward. We first settle the things that are certain and sure, that are of eternal value, and live in the light of that. I was noting down to say how if there are 10 problems that every human being faces in this life, Christianity or Christian faith is going to cause us to have the ninth and 10th problem solved first. And then we would work out from the begin, from, from, from all the rest of the problems. Because those are certain and the true uh, endings of every human being. That everyone certainly is going to head to eternity. Where they would spend is a question that ought to be answered in our lifetime not when we get into eternity. And so that's why Christian life is lived from the reality of etern eternality. Now, coming back to a life of ministry, to a life of Calvary. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and 20, 20, Paul gives to us a life of Calvary. He says, this is how he lives. He was writing to this church at Galatia, who, which had a lot of Jewish people. It had a lot of Jewish people and also some Gentiles. And these Jewish people had this big problem of Judaizers, those who followed the law, trying to impose the law upon them so that they can be made righteous by living out the law rather than living out the life that they can receive in Christ Jesus. Today, even after coming into Christianity, there is a preaching and a teaching of legalism that is so prevalent in the church where you and I are called to live out the scripture as though you and I are earning some brownie points before God. When you live a life of obedience, God is going to be giving some brownie points. That's a false preaching at the core because Christianity is not a life of legality or living out in legalism, but living out in liberty. This is what we see in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Paul was correcting that in this letter where he says, there is freedom in Christ Jesus. There is life and liberty in Christ Jesus. Come receive that life and live out that life that you and I receive in Christ Jesus. Let Christ live through you. And that's what he says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such as one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Every child of God comes to receive that righteousness that Christ had fulfilled on their behalf. And they come to receive that righteousness that is in Christ Jesus. And not just that righteousness, but a law of Christ. That is, a law of loving relationship with God. A law of living that Calvary life that Paul lived. And that's why, coming back to Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ with regards to the law that I can't keep, with regards to the legality, I am dead, I am crucified. I died along with Christ. When Christ died on the cross, he put that law that was against me, he nailed it to the cross. And he fulfilled that and he nailed it to the cross. And from that fulfilling of the law, he gives that righteousness to me so that I can live out that life of Calvary. Now Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. He identifies with Christ and he says, nevertheless I live. 
He's living in this world. He's not dead. He's not a zombie walking around. But the way he's living is, he's living and letting Christ live through him. And that's what he says. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Every day, Paul's life was a fresh devotion to his Savior who died for him on Calvary. Every day, Paul's life was lived out in this constraining love that flowed from Calvary into his life. And he lived out out of that reality. Not because of legality, but in that reality of Calvary that he lived out and let Christ live through him. Every point that he comes across, every, every step that he ought to take, his question was, what would Christ do if he was in my place today? With a job that he has to take, he would question himself, what would Christ do if he were to be in my place? With a decision he had to make, he would go about to question what would Christ do if he was in my place. And he was letting Christ live rather than he live. And so Christian life in the light of resurrection is to be lived out as, is, as a life of Calvary. Christian life is to be lived out as a life of ministry and as a life of Calvary. Now, there's so much more that we can glean from the life of Apostle Paul, but I'll, I'll just touch one part before we go to the second man's life that I want us to take note of. In uh, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, Paul calls us in the light of resurrection to the same truths that I was alluding to. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Paul goes about to say this, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall, be, ye shall also appear with him in glory. All these four verses I have read just primarily to capture this phrase, your life is hid with Christ in God. Where is our life? It's not with us. It is hid in Christ. We are to receive that life that is ours, that is in Christ. And as we set our affections on things above, that is our Lord Jesus Christ who is above and live in the light of who he is, that loving Savior that he is, who gave himself for me. You and I would live a life of Calvary in this world. Now quickly, the two other things from an Old Testament man by name Job. By the way, when we think about this eruption, we always think that it is a New Testament concept. But the truth is, the, life of uh, uh, the concept of resurrection has been there from the oldest of the books. And many times when we think of the oldest of the books, the first book that comes to our mind is the book of Genesis, right? But uh, when we see in chronology, Job lived almost or rather he is in and around the same time of this Job. For the first five books which Moses penned as the law, uh, was given to God's people. And so, in Job, we find nothing with regards to the, the Israelites and all those people. And so, which gives to us of how God was operating even before he was uh, operating with regards to the children of Israel. Now, from this oldest book, Job, we find that there is a reality of life that you and I come across. Uh, our seeing uh, here and uh, having a service, but um, in the light of that, 
I'll be bringing my two other points very quickly and we'll be closing soon. Okay. So uh, bear with me. In Job chapter 14, we come to read of a man who is deep in this reality of suffering that is there in this world. The fallen world that you and in real time is to understand how men of God dealt something in when Paul says that of resurrection and the and the partaking in the suffering how was it that these men of God forbear that suffering and lived through it and learned whatever they learned so that when you and I come across, you and I have such faith like these men of God. And so in the light of that, we come to see that Job is bringing to us in this chapter a life of brevity and misery. This is a reality of this world. That we live in. Our lives are like um, as vapor as the scripture says. Our lives are like shadow. They are there and they are passed away so quickly. And, Paul, and Job is reminding of the same things in Job chapter 14 verse 1. In the midst of the pain and suffering he takes note of, of certain things that are true. I won't talk through every verse that we read here. But uh, in the first five verses, he gives that snippet of a life of brevity and misery. In verse 1 itself, we read, Man that is born of a woman is of, a, is of few days and full of trouble. Few are his days, talking about the brevity. And full of trouble, talking about the misery. When we see all that we come to see through the life of Job, he was a very godly man. And yet, God, in his own sovereignty, had allowed what Job had to go through. Yes, when we see all that Job goes through, Job is not a man who is writing with hopeless words. You know, um, one of uh, the quote that I have taken note is that man's ways lead us to hopeless end, but God's ways lead us to endless hope. So opposite are ways of man and ways of God. And Job's words, though in the pain and suffering that he was in, in this chapter he touches on this, in this reality of brevity and misery of life, but he was not a man who didn't have hope. We'll come to that last part. But before that, a chapter before, in chapter 13, verse 15, you see the height of hope that Job had. He was willing to trust in this God to such an extent. In verse 15, he says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. For an hypocrite shall not come before him. Here is Job, who shows the full trust that he had on this God. Though he would allow the highest of suffering, he says, I will not leave my trust that I have upon him. That is Job. And how could he, how could he come to such a life, a life of sufficiency? In the midst of misery and brevity, he lived a life of sufficiency. And uh, by that, we ought not to assume that Job ignored whatever is happening. He is not moving away into some remote corner to be alleviated from pain. He was right in the midst along with his friends who were trying to, who came to comfort him, but rather comforting, they were adding to that pain, right? And in all this, we see Job asks two pertinent questions. He asks two pertinent questions, 
and he makes four profound statements i only will touch remind us of that and then move on to the words hope that he has and where he drew that hope from now the two questions that he asks are found here in verse 10 and in verse 14 let's read those two verses quickly the question that job asks is but a man dieth and wasteth away yea man giveth up the ghost and where is he these are questions that needs to be asked by every human being who knows that this world is full of suffering and trouble where does man go when he is going to give up his ghost job asked that question you know we live in this world many who do not want to even talk about death because they are they're not wanting to face what would come from that question and job asked that right question not only that in verse 14 he asked the second question these are pertinent questions pro very important questions that needs to be asked by every human being in verse 14 he says if a man dies shall he live again all the days of my appointed time will i wait till my change come he's asking these questions eternity many a times people don't live or face the suffering that is there in this world in a right way because of the lack of the knowledge of what happens to them beyond the grave and when you ask that question just like job what happens in eternity you and i would be given the knowledge to face with a right approach the misery and the suffering that is there in this world life is filled with brevity and misery but it is not beyond the sufficiency of god it is not beyond the sufficiency of god god supplies to us in our misery and pain what is needed when job asked these questions he is not a man without answers he had some statements to make in the same chapter he makes four profound statements the first one we already read which talks about brevity and misery in verse 1 few are the days and full of trouble are they the second statement he makes is in verse 2 he says he cometh forth like a flower and is cut down he fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not the says the statement job is making is that yes there is blossoming state that man has but that is not going to last forever it's only temporal he comes to realize this and he makes this profound statement the first statement about brevity the second statement about how the temporality of our blossoming is in verse 2 then in verse 5 he also makes another statement he says seeing his days are determined the number of the thou has point lives boundary is number of months it's not in our health, our wealth neither in anything of us but in his hands a boundary of our life he saw that and he made a statement of that god determines the number of months number of moments number of days that you and i are to live they cannot be passed even if you have the greatest of the health they are bound by god and so he made that statement and quickly the fourth statement then i'll come to the last point of mine in verse 12 he makes this statement so a man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more they shall not awake not be raised out of their sleep job makes about the city of death there is a certain death that he comes to see in the 12 all these four states found this net this creation to glean some answers and he does that in three ways in chapters 14 verses 6 to 9 
Job considers the tree that is hewed down, that is cut down. In verses 7, verses 7 to 9, Job considers about the hope of a tree. For there is hope of a tree. It cut down that it will spring of will not cease. You know, I will that God had promised resurrection. The resurrection on every leaf that comes in any time. Job, uh, sorry, Luther might have got from here, is my guess. I don't know. But he says, just like a tree that has hope, even if it is cut down, there's a tender branch, a new life that sprouts out. Job looked around this creation to receive that hope. that he saw to this in sin, he sees how the waters failed from the sea and blood lays dry up. He also saw two things that are at play. There is one side creation that echoes life. On the other side, there is creation that fails and fades or that dries away. Verse 11 and then verse 18, he talks about the mountain. He saw three things in creation. One is tree, one is third one, and the rock is removed out of. When we look at all this, Job looked around the creation to understand how God works. And uh, he saw two sides of it the physical life that decays. And then there is a new life as well, seen as in the hope of the tree. Now, from all this life that Job comes to see, he has most... Let's turn quickly to Job chapter 19, verse 25, the last portion. Job chapter 19, verse 25 to 27. Job comes to learn from... And suffering and misery that he is boring in this world, he is bearing in this world, uh, for where in this world, he see that he longs and he comes to this state of hope in verses 25. This is not somebody who saw the story of Calvary. This was not somebody who saw a Lord who put to death and rose again. Much, much before Job, in the earliest of the books of the Bible, and he gives a, a statement that is to be etched on a rock. Take note in verse 23, he says, what his heart's desire is, 23 onwards. Oh, that my words were now written. What a privilege that you and I can read that. They are really written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Are they not printed in a book? And then he says that they were graven with an iron pen and lead in the rock forever. They are etched for eternity so that you and I can say with Job. These are, these are words of eternity that were penned down by a man who was in suffering, but not without hope. He comes to say these profound statements, the greatest of the statements that we come to read in the book of Job. In the midst of all the suffering, this godly man had a life of eternity. He had a life of eternity to look up to, which is why he says, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the later day upon the earth. What heights of hope that God brought him to. Many times when we are led through this pain and suffering, you and I are led to a glorious heights of hopes. Just like Job, he comes to see the towering height of hope that God had brought him to, to say these words that are eternal words, that are ever settled words, and preserved. We come to see, he says, I know 
in the midst pain is going to bring us to the promise of resurrection more and more which is why we come to see not just in the life of job but paul as he says that i may know the power of resurrection and the partaking in the sufferings of our lord jesus christ oh when we take note of these great men who endured the pain and passed on to embrace the promise of the power of resurrection you and i we would hesitate or we would retard but we would welcome for the glorious hope for that much assurance for long for eternity more and more we'll we we'll conclude by saying by reading that word and though after my skin worms destroy this body yet in my flesh shall i see god whom i shall see for myself oh the personal privilege of beholding our savior for whom our lives will be worth spending and the more we spend our lives the more we want to see our beloved savior whom i shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another or oh, not a second hand experience of of seeing my savior the first hand experience oh we have some wonderful songs that have come out of this i know my redeemer liveth and then uh, there's this under, another song uh, where it talks about what will i say when i see my savior what will i say when i see and behold his face that loved me and gave himself for me that's what paul say uh, the job says here whom i shall see for myself and mine own eyes shall behold and not another though my reins be consumed within me oh this is this life of eternity that awaits a life of eternity that we would long for and so when we come to see this order of residing in this life that we are living we are going to live a life of ministry a life of calvary a life of sufficiency in the midst of misery and a life of eternity that we would long for that our lives may be brought forth in the light of resurrection to much serving much loving you know paul says who loved me and gave himself for me it turned this life of calvary that he was living to express much love so it would result in much loving and in the midst of pain we live in much suffering we would long for much enjoying that will be our portion unto eternity where uh, all this would result in a glorious hope that we have beyond the grave may the lord enable us to live out such a life and that order of living would be our portion of these great men like paul and job who lived out in the midst of all that they endured that they lived a life was uh even that speaks what let as the lord for his on this word and uh to live beholding him pages i will ask for the as the lord is blessing on this word a loving heavenly father we thank you please you for bringing us this evening thy precious word and to the life of apostle paul and of the father we thank you we praise you that uh, you brought us not just the order of rising that you have set in course in motion lord that we may be in the same order come to partake father you have also 
set an order of living in this world through the godly men who walked before us that we may live out a life of ministry to serve you fully that we may live out a life of calvary to love you wholeheartedly lord that we may live out a life of sufficiency in the midst of pain and suffering lord that we may live out a life of eternity that we would long for to enjoy you forever and ever father who are we lord that you have loved us so much and the power of resurrection that is available in this world to foretaste bless our lives to be lived the reality of eternity father that our lives may be not lived for the ones and the things that are temporal but the one who is eternal who loved me and who loved us and gave himself for us father we ask that you would bless thy we pray for those that are yet to give their hearts to you that they too may have this hope and this work of salvation done in them we pray that you would bless our time of fellowship and the rest of our week as well for we ask all this in jesus precious name amen